He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. I'm going to play you a clip of something that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. It comes from the late great comedian Bill Hicks and it contains a very funny F-bomb. If you don't believe drugs have done good things for us, do me a favor then. Go home tonight, take all your albums, your tapes and your CDs and burn them. Because you know what? The musicians who made that great music that has enhanced your lives throughout the years real fucking high on drugs, okay? So for most of us, we've been told our entire lives that drugs are bad, okay? Even the word drugs has come to have this really negative association with it. And as artists, I think it's important to have an honest discussion about the negatives and the positives that can come from taking substances that change your perception. Because Bill Hicks was right, and a lot of music and visual art are created in response to experiences that come from taking drugs. So today on the podcast, I brought on my friend Caspian Kai to talk about his experiences using psychedelics, among other things, to enhance his work and change his perception. Caspian lives in Vancouver and is an amazing 3D artist whose work definitely has a little bit of that otherworldly psychedelic vibe to it. And I wanted to ask him about the things he's tried, the substances he's taken, the risks inherent in taking things that are illegal and maybe even a little dangerous, and about the misconceptions that seem to run rampant around the use of these chemicals that alter your consciousness. This episode gets a little heady and we go into some topics that might make you a little uncomfortable if you have very strong feelings about the use of quote drugs but hopefully this conversation will give you a bit of a different perspective on the whole thing and who knows maybe your curiosity will be piqued but before we hear from Caspian let's first hear from one of our incredible School of Motion alumni my name is Ryan Plummer and I live in Dallas Texas I've actually completed the animation boot camp course I recommend that course, I mean, to everybody, everybody I know in post-production, I say, listen, you know, get, you know, six, eight weeks of your time and just dedicate to this and you're going to come out the other side, you're going to be better. I've, I've gained so much from taking the animation bootcamp course. It's definitely boosted my career and it's really taken it off to a whole new level. I get to, I build these daily projects now and and I I post on my Instagram and now actually I'm getting into a new job with a major car company here in the U.S. because they saw my stuff. Thank you, School in Motion. You guys have just phenomenally changed changed what it is that I do and how I do it. My name is Ryan Plummer and I'm a School of Motion graduate. Caspian, dude, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about this stuff. I cannot wait to pick your brain. Yeah, no worries, Joey. Thanks for having me. So for everyone listening, can you just give us a brief kind of background on you? You know, where do you live? What do you do? What's your job? Yeah, so I live in Vancouver, BC, Canada, Um, originally from Melbourne, Australia. I've uh, lived over here for about three years now. And uh, yeah, I'm a motion designer, sort of about uh, 10 years experience, I guess now, Um, mainly focused on 3D using Cinema 4D. Awesome. And we're going to link to your site in the show notes and everyone should go check it out because you've got some really, really cool work um, and really interesting abstract visually too, which I'm, I'm very excited to get into how you arrive at that stuff. So, you know, the, the topic we're discussing today is, I guess, the use of, you know, substances to enhance or alter our perceptions as artist. It's really controversial. So to start, I'm wondering if you can just kind of sum up what your stance is on the use of, I I guess I'll use the term drugs, but you can correct me if you disagree with that term. Yeah, totally. Um, Yeah, it's a very interesting and deep topic. Um, Yeah, stoked to talk about it. Um, I think anything that sort of changes our base levels of perception or our consciousness can be a very valuable tool. So that's that's one word I've been using a lot lately. And I, f- I find a lot of other people like even Joe Rogan and people who do podcasts like that will use that word uh, tool. Or the other one is medicine um, because they can be very powerful medicines for healing, um, especially things like psychological trauma or anxiety and depression. Um, and th- there's just so many different types of drugs to you to use that term again um yeah like from pharmaceutical drugs uh, but then obviously you've got things like alcohol tobacco cannabis 
um, and then you've got more research lab drugs and then you've got psychedelics and plant-based um, drugs which or medicines which uh, I, I'm personally a fan of and I think they're they're uh, very powerful creative tools for inspiration um, as well as think spiritual awareness and uh, mystical experiences and uh, also um, healing psychological trauma like I mentioned before so there's a lot of research that, that's that's happening um, into things like psycho psychological trauma and PTSD and depression Cool. Well, I'm interested in your use of the word medicine because uh, yeah, I'm sure when most people hear the word medicine, they think of something very different than what you're talking about. They think of the the little pill bottle that their doctor prescribes them that has medicine in it, but that's not what you're talking about. So when you say medicine, what are you referring to? Yeah, well, well, like I said, um, uh, that, that's the sort of um, accepted social norm of the term medicine, I guess, what people think of. They think of um, pharmaceutical drugs that have been made in a, in a factory and they're, they're using certain chemicals, um, which can often be very dangerous and have lots of side effects um, in themselves. So you really have to know what you're doing and make sure the dose is right and have your prescription. And, and even then, um, often there can just be a, a rabbit hole of different pharmaceuticals that people use and, with, and just keep getting different side effects. Um, so when I, when I use the term medicine, I, I, as I said, I'm talking more about um, healing issues with yourself, um, whether that be uh, it, like psychological issues like anxiety um, and depression and um, other trauma you may have had in your life and um, especially the, the plant-based psychedelics um, so things like mushrooms um, ayahuasca DMT um, I think that and many more I think there's uh, cactus as well as an, another one um, so I think I think they're very powerful for healing it's interesting, and I've heard that that argument before. That you know, essentially, it's semantics. It you know, the, the active compounds in you know mushrooms, right? Psilocybin. Um, you know, it's got a different chemical makeup, different effects, but essentially, it's the same as you know. There's a chemical compound that's active in Viagra, but Viagra, <laughs> you know, is is marketed and comes in this nice kind of synthetic looking blue pill. And mushrooms grow out of piles of crap usually. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so, okay. So that's interesting. I just kind of wanted to clear that up for everybody that, you know, I, cause I agree with you and a lot of the, the questions I'm going to ask you are devil's advocate questions. Um, but I want to make sure everyone kind of understands the word medicine in this conversation. It refers to active compounds, I, I guess is a good way to put it. Now, when I was growing up Caspian, I, uh, you know, all of the anti-drug advertising and messaging really worked on me. So I was terrified to try, you know, I didn't even drink alcohol until I basically got out of high school, which was very rare growing up in Fort Worth, Texas. So um, I'm curious if, if you felt that growing up or if you've always sort of had a more open mind about these things. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think you're spot on. Like we're all very uh, conditioned by our upbringing, um, where we live, uh, our parents, and definitely the media. Uh, the power of the media is not to be underestimated. And a lot of that does come from the government and uh, the, the structures that we, we live in, the society we live in. Uh, and it's been that way for, for decades. Um, a lot of it coming from um, the US government and then filtering to, to other Western governments around the world. Um, but yeah, myself, I think I've always been pretty open-minded. Um, at least when I got to, to that certain age, like around sort of uh, 18, 19, um, I, I got very curious and interested to start trying um, some different substances. Um, but there's definitely still a, a fear or uncertainty with anything, especially new things um, and trying things for the first time. So any, any kind of um, chemical that's going to alter your brain chemicals, um, th there is that uh, uncertainty. And I think that's a healthy thing. If we didn't, if we didn't have uncertainty and fear, I think it would be a lot more dangerous and crazy and everyone would be trying everything. Um, because some things are not for some people. So I think you've got to understand that too. Um, you got to, you got to approach things cautiously and try them and then find out if they're for you or not. So what was the, what was the thing in your life that kind of made you curious enough to try these things? I mean, were you, you know, was it peer pressure? Your friends offer you something you didn't want to be rude or was there, you know, for me personally, I got really into the band Tool <laughs> for many, many years. I was yeah. obsessed with them and, you know, their lyrics and their artwork um, heavily influenced by psychedelic experiences. And so that's kind of what pushed me over the edge to, to start exploring this stuff. So I'm curious if you had something like that. 
Yeah, um, I wouldn't say it was um, artwork or anything in particular that, that uh, influenced it. Um, there's different different um, substances. I guess the, probably the first one I tried was more in like a social or, or party uh, sense would have been MDMA, and I think that could be the, the same could be said for a lot of people. Uh, when you, I, I was um, DJing from a young age in in Melbourne, uh, in that that underground party scene, and um, yeah, it was, it was pretty common for people to have MDMA to sort of open themselves up and have a good time um, as a party drug. But uh, my first psychedelic um, experience that was very powerful and influential was about when I was about 19. I went to my first um, outdoor music festival or rave or doof, is it often called in Australia. Um, and it's a big one called Rainbow Serpent. Um, so, so yeah, it's been on for going for about 20 years now. And there's about 20,000 people that go each year. Um, and yeah, I went there when I was super young and naive with a couple of friends and, um, first sort of first night there, I was super underprepared and, um, yeah, we just, uh, we had a bit of liquid LSD, which, uh, this Israeli guy had in a little vial around his neck, like a little bottle, which is actually, um, a pretty like rare way to get it these days. Uh, it's usually in a tab form. I think most people would sort of know that it's sort of, um, diluted and spread across, um, sheets of paper. But yeah, this was in a liquid form and that, that night was just unbelievable. Like it's, it's so vividly etched in my memory. And I think the same can be said for a lot of people's first LSD trip. It's very life changing. Um, so yeah, danced all night, which dance is just an amazing thing as well in itself that a lot of people forget about and underestimate. <laughs> um, but then hallucinations kind of started, uh, at sunrise, um, and sort of seeing things in a different way, seeing the ground undulate and move and seeing the grass sway in a different way, really like breathing. You almost see the earth breathing and it really connects you with nature. Um, but also then there was like the hilarity and humor of, of it, the way it opens, it changes your brain in, in a way that you become a lot more quick witted and humorous and everyone else around you who, if they've taken it as well, um, can be on the same level. Um, and you get this really interesting human connection and, and, and oneness, I guess, um, is really important as well. Yeah. And I, I can second that I, I have tried, um, both MD, I've never tried LSD, but I've tried MDMA and I, I have tried mushrooms before. Um, and you know, especially on mushrooms, I remember, you know, being with my friends laughing hysterically just at, you know, the wall, mm -hmm. the floor. And at the time I was younger when I did it, I was in my early twenties and, you know, both of those things at the time I was doing for entertainment essentially, because I thought it would be fun. It would be novel, something new and interesting. Um, and it wasn't necessarily searching for deeper spiritual meaning or any sort of new artistic perspective. So I'm curious if, if that's sort of how you approach those first few times, or were you already sort of aware that this could be a really useful tool to, um, I don't know, look at the world a different way, which eventually as an artist can be a very useful thing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, definitely in the early years uh, when I was younger, it was more of a social connector and a, and a party thing, I guess, like people often say, say like party drug, like MDMA. Um, the same was similar for L LSD and mushrooms for me. Like I only had them very occasionally. Um, I actually only had LSD at Rainbow Serpent um, pretty much once a year for the first few years. And, and it was, I just loved it in, being in nature. And I, and I hadn't really thought about um, doing it in a different setting, like at home or on my own or doing it for different things like art, even though I was doing a lot of art and design in my early 20s as well. Um, but in, even in that first trip, um, I actually had a friend that brought a graffiti art book to the festival and in the morning he was like flipping through it and we were looking at it and just like seeing the way, seeing the art in a different way too, like seeing the way it moved and, and um, all the little characters came popping out of the graffiti and, and almost like winking at you and laughing at you and stuff um, was really interesting. So that, that sticks with me a lot. And every time you do like a psychedelic, like mushrooms or LSD, uh, you definitely see art in a different way and see it move in a different way. Cool. I think it would be useful at this point to uh, clarify, I guess, some of the substances we're talking about because you know, earlier I used the term drugs. And when I say drugs, you know, I think of like hard drugs, like, you know, cocaine and, and heroin, but also marijuana kind of falls in there. And I'm curious, um, you know, 
a how do you think about sort of drugs and how do you categorize them and 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 also what drugs are you most interested in? I mean, you know, you've mentioned uh, you know uh, LSD and mushrooms, but it, you know, do you see any any use in taking things that are hard, you know I guess harder and even dangerous? You know, like cocaine or um, I mean, even MDMA is sort of dangerous. You can overdose on it, things like that. Um, do, do you sort of have a limit of how far you're willing to go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it comes with um, experience and preference. Um, definitely, the thing, I'm not a big fan of cocaine, although it, it is kind of naturally derived from the coca leaves. It is highly processed and kind of toxic and, and I think dangerous. I also think it's uh, quite addictive compared to a lot of other substances. Um, and the same goes for, I guess, you, when you say harder drugs, things like heroin and other opiates, which are, are downers, um, and uh, yeah, and again, have like a high risk of addiction. Um, although if they're probably, you know, there are people that probably do them in a more responsible and moderate way. Um, but then, and then the other dangerous ones that I, I'm trying not to do as much of these days are, um, is alcohol as well, because I think that's an extremely dangerous, uh, harmful drug. And there's been a lot of studies done um, in, in all over the world, but um, there's a, f a famous British uh, psychiatrist, David Nutt, um, who was famous for doing some studies. And uh, he, I think he said alcohol ranks as the fifth most harmful drug after heroin, cocaine, uh, barbiturates, and methadone. And tobacco was r ranked ninth. And then in comparison to that, cannabis, LSD, and ecstasy, while, while still a bit harmful, are ranked lower at 11, 14, and 18. Um, so yeah, in, in term, and I think that encompasses a lot of different factors that they researched, in, like harm to the self and harm to others and all kinds of stuff like that. But per personally speaking, I guess my, my preference is definitely for the plant-based um, psychedelics. Um, and that includes cannabis, although I'm not a he heavy cannabis user, I, it is nice occasionally. Um, and it is kind, it can be psychedelic depending how much you do and in what way you do it, but definitely not as kind of hallucinatory and stuff as psilocybin mushrooms. Right. You brought up a you brought up a really good point. I want to dig into a little bit, which is something that you know in the U.S. right now, there's a lot of states that are starting to legalize marijuana, and um, you know, high school Joey would have poo pooed that. Oh, but it's dangerous, and you know. Now, as an adult, I look at something like alcohol, which is far more destructive, um, and it just seems like such a such a hypocritical kind of thing to to allow alcohol to be sold in mass quantities at bars and restaurants and liquor stores, where you can very easily drink too much and make yourself really sick or die or make poor decisions, get in a car and kill somebody. Whereas if you smoke too much weed, you ain't doing anything, you know, <laughs> you're going to, you're going to be, exactly. be glued to that couch and, and you're going to just be laughing a lot. And, you know, you're, you, you know, people who are high don't get in bar fights. And <laughs> so it's really interesting. And, and, um, you know, I wonder now that you're, you're sort of more experienced with other, you know, substances, psilocybin, MDMA, things that are still illegal, I'm assuming, even, in, even in Canada, um, do you have any thoughts on why those things are still illegal, but alcohol is so prevalent, so legal? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. A lot of people are, are trying to change that. A lot of um, doctors and psychologists and, and very, very knowledgeable people have been dedicating their entire lives to try and change that, or at least to try and legalize um, psychedelics for psychotherapy um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, alcohol was obviously illegal in the 1920s and 1930s in America and I think for even longer in Canada. I think I read somewhere it was like from 1900 to, to 1950 oh, almost, wow. which is, is a long time. But yeah, I think the government um, the governments around the world realized that alcohol was a, a good one to be able to monetize and make and make money a lot of money off. Um, as well as it, they, I think there's a perception that it's not as... Um, dangerous to people waking up uh, as other substances. I think it's it's about control. And I think alcohol being a downer and being on, it, it puts you in a lower state of consciousness, in my opinion. It sort of dumbs you down and you, you're not likely to have amazing epiphanies and come up with amazing ideas about how you can change the world. When, you, when you're drunk, right. you're more likely to just get violent and get in a fight or something. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of different factors there, but I think a lot of it is down to control 
and uh, wasn't so much taking into account the the dangers side of things. Um, whereas when I think LSD was banned in 1968, and it'd probably been um, over 10 years of, of it being legal and being like community, like lots of communities and people uh, using LSD for different purposes, obviously the, the psychedelic 60s and that, that whole movement. Um, and I think, it, again, that, that could have been t um, to do with the government being scared of a, a lack of control, uh, people really waking up and protesting the Vietnam War and, and uh, really wanting change uh, from the government. So uh, that's my opinion anyway. I think there's a lot of different opinions on, on um, why things were banned. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear your opinion, your opinion, though. And one of the things that I want everyone listening to kind of take away from this because, um, you know, I'm hoping that some of what you hear might make you uncomfortable and even talking about these things can be fairly taboo depending on your upbringing and things like that. Um, but, you know, s starting to think critically about these things, uh, I think is really important. And just understanding that while it's socially acceptable to pour a glass of scotch and drink that, and I love scotch, tastes really good, but <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it, it's just strange to me that it's far more destructive than smoking a joint, you know, in, in terms of like the potential downsides. Uh, and yet in Florida where I live, it's still illegal to, you know, to just go out and, and buy weed like that. So let's, um, let's play devil's advocate here, Caspian. So, you know, we've kind of hinted at some of the benefits that you've seen, and we'll get into those a little bit later. But first, let's talk about the, you know, the downsides, because most of us, especially in the United States, have been told from the day we were, you know, probably two or three years old, drugs are bad, don't do drugs, this is your brain on drugs, and, and you're just, you know, it's going to ruin your life, and you'll spiral out into homelessness. So maybe there are some creative you know, advantages to using these things. And maybe there are some therapeutic uses, but don't you think that those are outweighed by the downsides of these, these dangerous substances that could just take over and ruin your life and make you crazy? <laughs> um, definitely not. I think it's, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of misconceptions. And uh, I, I think when you try and control and, and uh, stop people from, from doing things, that can lead to a lot of danger as well. Um, people being misinformed and getting things from um, drug dealers that are not reputable and uh, all kinds of other things added to the drugs and there's lots of dangers, dangers in that side of things. But I think it, when things are legalized and not, and not so um, uh, frowned upon and, and uh, dangerous, um, you look at countries like Portugal and other countries in Europe that have legalized and um, crime and uh, drug overdoses and all kinds of things the rates have gone down and there's been a lot of um, proof that it's that's a it's a good thing deregulizing decriminalizing um, and I just think anything anything in excess um, can be seen as risking your life right like excess alcohol excess uh, cigarettes is going to kill you in the end excessive speeding in a car or, um, eating too much food there's all kinds of things um, and I think it's all about your intention and being able to moderate and when when people are worried about their their kids or teenagers or younger people I think that's that's to do with education um, both from parents and from schools and people should be educated on drugs and psychedelics uh, and, and substances from a young age and educated about the dangers and what they're going to do to your mind and, and, and do to your body instead we don't hear about them at all like we don't get taught about drugs at all um, which is crazy. <laughs> I recently did um, a, a sort of volunteer training program, an organization here in Vancouver called Karmic, um, who do harm reduction. Um, so they, they work uh, both in music festivals, but also in the downtown east side in, in Vancouver, which is um, a little bit of a rough area. And um, they, they help a lot of people, but they, they do a great job in, in training people to help as well. So I think that's amazing. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, to, to see a, a state that's getting a lot of press these days in the U.S. is uh, Colorado because, you know, they fully legalized. They've got a really big infrastructure around uh, marijuana production and sales and stuff like that. Um, and there's statistics coming out, you know, and dr drunk driving deaths go down and things like that because now there's an alternative. Um, and, you know, w as you're talking, it kind of reminds me of like something recently that happened to me, which was I, um, I hurt my back working out and I went to the doctor and the first thing they did was it really, they didn't do an x-ray or an MRI or anything. They just prescribed me Oxycontin, which is 
you know, it's and and that is a that is a really dangerous substance. It's very addictive. It's very powerful, but it's socially acceptable to just give somebody a bottle full of this stuff um, when you know maybe smoking a joint would have made my back feel better. <laughs> Been a lot cheaper too. Yeah. So okay, so l- let me ask you another question. So um, you know, obviously, if you take if you smoke a joint, if you um, eat mushrooms, take some MDMA, you're going to alter your perception and and. As an artist, there's something appealing about that, at least to me, the idea that, you know, my well has run dry and all I have to do is, you know, eat this thing and wait a few hours. And all of a sudden, I'm going to have some strange thoughts that I would never have in in any other scenario. Are there other ways to do that? You know, couldn't you just like meditate or go to a museum, look at some weird art or something? Like, wouldn't that do the same thing? Yeah, it can. It, they can do. Um, I think inspiration can come from just about anywhere. Um, uh, meditation is a big one. That, and I've uh, been practicing meditation a lot over the last two years. Not not so much recently, but it was, uh, you know, a long period where I was pra- practicing meditation every morning. Um, it was a particular practice called heart rhythm meditation. Um, where I went to do some classes here in Vancouver, um, but it's actually based on a, a Sufi practice, a Sufi Muslim practice, um, which I mean, if you've heard of the poet Rumi, but he, he was a Sufi. Um, and it's, it's amazing uh, benefits. And I did definitely get um, in, inspiration for art from it, especially from the longer meditations. So when I would meditate for uh, over 40, like probably half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, um, when you really focus and you're really aware of your breathing and, and you, um, you, you learn certain um, specific visualization practices that are part of the meditation, start, this, this style anyway. Um, and then the longer you do it, I think the, the more beneficial that can be. But, but I would say um, like psychedelics, uh, even in small doses, can be either a shortcut to those same kind of um, imagination or imaginary visions or dreamlike visions and accessing the subconscious or they can work hand in hand with meditation and enhance meditation um so that yeah definitely a lot of um people that will combine the two and the other one um that i've been trying in the last year or so um is uh flotation tanks i don't know if you've heard of those but they're yeah like so there's basically sensory deprivation um solo tanks that you go into and so it's all dark and you're floating in a shallow amount of water but it's it's filled with salt um so it's really effortless and uh it's just an amazing sort of feeling um you feel like you're just floating in space or something and you do it for a minimum minimum of 60 minutes but you know you can do for 90 minutes or two hours at some places and uh, personally, I haven't tried that in combination with psychedelics yet, but uh, I know there's people that do, even people that run these uh, flotation centers uh, sort of advocate or talk about their experiences combining things like mushrooms. Um, or think, Actually, the guy that invented the flotation tanks, John C. Lilly, I think um, experimented a lot with ketamine in flotation tanks, which although that is more of um, a sort of a lab drug, I guess you could say, it is a psychedelic as well. So yeah, definitely lots of different ways. I I love hearing about this stuff. I've never tried the flotation tank thing. I'm dying to try it. Um, you know, it, it it's it's funny. Like the more that I got into my career and and, and where having a, a unique point of view about things and a unique take on things becomes an asset. Um, I don't know. It's 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 kind of nice to have these things. And you use the word tools earlier. You know, in this interview, and I think that's actually started to make a lot of sense that. These things can be tools, and you, you you know you said that using the chemical is sort of a shortcut. So it's almost like you know buying a plug-in. It's like it just saves you time. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, are you at all concerned with the toll that these drugs could take on your body, or do you think they're pretty safe? I think they're pretty safe. <laughs> um, obviously, like because they're illegal and st- like there is research going on, but a lot of it is kind of behind closed doors and not, um, you know, government sa- uh, sanctioned or doesn't have the resources behind it. Um, it'd be great to, to be able to have more legal studies into the effects of certain substances. But um, I think it's it's pretty well um, regarded that the dangers of things like mushrooms or LSD um, and even DMT and things like that, they're not they're not going to kill you. They're not going to, you're not going to overdose. Um, as I said before, a lot of it's to do with like moderation and, you know, you know, if you did like 10 hits of acid, that's going to be very different to doing one hit. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. And even just like the frequency too. So if you did, um, LSD every day, you'd probably have trouble sleeping and forget what 
normal consciousness was like <laughs> and struggle to function. Um, but if you microdose, which is, is really interesting uh, movement that's happening, um, maybe taking like a really tiny uh, portion of a, of a tab. So people, I think people do about one tenth. Um, and then you, you also take like one or two day breaks in between each dose as well. So if you if you did that, I don't think there'd be any phys- physical or mental toll, and it, it, there's lots of interesting uh, studies being done into the effectiveness. That's interesting, you know. Microdosing. Yeah, everything in moderation, I guess. I want to come back to microdosing in a little bit because I'm really curious about that. It's that's a term that I've only heard of recently. Um, and and when I was you know talking to you a little while ago, you mentioned it, and that's that's why you're on the podcast today because uh, I'm very curious about that. So I have one more question. Uh, about sort of the negatives. And this one is actually, I think, a true negative. You know, a lot of the other ones, it's kind of questionable. Is this actually harmful to take LSD or to take mushrooms or to smoke weed? Um, You know, you could probably find people who would argue both sides. But right now, a lot of these substances are still illegal. And I'm not exactly sure what the laws are in Canada, but in the United States, if you're caught with you know, LSD, you can go to jail. Uh, I'm curious if you worry about that, if you, you know, feel like you kind of have to, you know, be really careful when you're, you know, buying these things and taking them. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, It's definitely, it's something you have to like worry or stress about a little bit. Um, I guess, as I was talking about before, it's it's only been a a short amount of time, really, if you think about 1968, LSD being illegal, that these things have actually been illegal. Um, but um, even even cannabis, I think, is a Schedule One drug in the states, which is puts it on the same level as as cocaine and heroin, which is ridiculous. Right. I mean, obviously, there's st- there's states that are legalizing, um, but yet federally, it's still a Schedule One, like highly illegal drug, which you can get in a lot of trouble. I think even if you you know transporting it between states or transporting it across the Canadian U.S. border or something like that, you'd probably get locked up and get you know banned from traveling and all kinds of things. So. Yeah, it's 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 crazy, really. Like it's taking it. It's gradually changing, but it's definitely taking a lot of time. Um, but even just like talking about cannabis, like the fact that you've banned a plant to that extent um, is just it blows my mind. Like people can grow it in their backyards, yet it's that highly illegal. Yeah, it, it's interesting too. I mean, I don't have really a ton of experience with this, but I kind of have this impression that you know one of the real downsides of having all of these chemicals be illegal and and as illegal as they are is that it drives all of their sales into the hands of you know criminals and cartels and and people like that and the types of people that would sell you cocaine or heroin I'm assuming are probably a little different than the types of people that would sell you psilocybin um you know or ayahuasca or something like that I'm curious if you know, in, in order to get th- these chemicals, you know, to microdose with LSD or things like that, are you exposing yourself to really, really seedy sort of criminal elements the way you'd have to if you wanted to buy, you know, a, a harder drug? <clears throat> not at all. Not at all. Um, uh, personally speaking, anyway, the, the people that I know that um, have these these kind of things are really lovely people. Um, I think because most psychedelics are opening you up um, to spiritual awakenings and um, you're really just opening up your mind. I think most people that are into them um, are just of a very different mindset to that really. Like, yes, the people that are dealing them in high, like high quantities are still doing it for money, um, but their intentions and, and like who they're trying to sell to and all that kind of thing is a lot less shady than someone that's trying to traffic cocaine or heroin or something like that. Right. There's not a lot of drive-by shootings because of, you know, peyote or something like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, let's talk about some of the, the benefits uh, that, that you've seen. And, and you mentioned, you know, you, you, I think you said a few times spiritual awakening, which is a pretty, like, you know, to someone who has tried these things and is already sort of a spiritual person, that might mean something. But you know, there's probably a lot of people who hear that and are like, I have no idea what you mean by spiritual awakening, Caspian. So can you sort of clarify that aspect of it? What do you mean when you say it opens you up? Yeah, and that's a good question too, because I think lots of people have different experiences. But as I mentioned before, it's like that that um, that sense of oneness, which I've had from uh, meditation too. I think you can, from uh, really deep meditation, you can have these, these kind of spiritual 
uh, feelings or awakenings too. But um, just I think people go through their day to day lives um, very closed off. Like obviously you have um, like organized religion and things like that, which people are very turned off by because of all their constraints. And um, yeah, it's it's people people are not fans of that organized religion much anymore but in terms of like spirituality as it, itself it's just um certain realizations and certain visions you might have so whether that's in meditation or um under the influence of psychedelics and um yeah it could be visitations by spirits so i know a lot of people i i, get, I think i've had i've definitely had a few especially from dmt um visitations by spirits um which seem extremely real like more real than reality in a way it sort of makes you almost question what reality is um but then uh yeah the people that will say they've encountered god or a god-like being or simply just a, a void or a white light and that that it gives them lots of different realizations i know people that um have done dmt or there's another similar substance called 5-meo dmt um that sort of um give people the the experience of um, the realization that like I am God or that you know that I, I am you know, why why am I any different from a spiritual being which is really interesting because especially as a creator and as an artist like you are you're creating day to day so how is that any different from being the creator yeah so DMT for anyone listening who's not familiar uh, it's also called I believe the spirit molecule um, and it I, I and you may know more about this Caspian but it, it naturally occurs in your body already and it naturally occurs in plants and things like that I mean it's I think one of the issues with DMT it, from the government's perspective is there's no way to outlaw the plants that you can get it from because it's like grass you know and if you know a yeah. chemist who can <laughs> synthesize it and give you DMT and it essentially I've never done it um, I'm, su I'm super curious about it I've just never had the opportunity um, but I, I, I've heard basically what you said, that you have these experiences that ca cause you to question everything and rethink the very nature mm -hmm. of reality. And all of this is really super interesting to me as a, you know, it's just a curious person. I'm curious about the nature of consciousness, things like that. But let's, let's bring it back a little bit to, to, to the motion design industry, right? And, and not just motion design, but art in general. There's been a lot of artists very famous work and very famous bands and songs that have been written with the assistance of some of these, I'm going to use the word tools because I like that word. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I mentioned that tool was kind of my gateway band into sort of starting to think about experimenting and trying different things. And uh, the artist that does, you know, their album covers, his name is Alex Gray. And if you, I, I mean, I wouldn't know from experience, but if you look at his work, I've been told that's what it looks like when you take DMT. You know, it's, it's sort of everything inside out and you can see everything from all angles all at the same time. Um, so I'm curious if you've seen as an artist benefits on, you know, to, to your, your creations, your creative process, or just the, the, you know, the color combinations you come up with Do you see a practical use for doing these things that help your profession? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's another really interesting topic. Um, Alex Gray is amazing. I've just recent, recently um, read his book uh, called The Mission of Art, which is just a, it's a paperback. It has some sort of sketches and artwork in it as well. But I'd highly, highly recommend that for anyone, even, even motion designers as well, or anyone that's into art and creativity. Um, but it really sort of changed my perspective on sort of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And um, yeah, it's it's a brilliant book. But uh, there's so many other visionary artists, and that's one thing that Alex and his wife Alison Gray um, are really big big on is pushing this visionary art movement, which is artwork that's derived or like influenced by visions. So whether that be from uh, tools tools such as psychedelics, or whether that just be for meditation or dreams or day to day things that come in, into your into your imagination. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other visionary artists I could mention. But um, another one that I personally really love is uh, Android Jones, and um, he's he's been around for quite a while now. In a, uh, but he's been doing some. He, he does a lot of digital art and digital painting with Photoshop, um, but also uses 3D. Uses he uses um, sculpting tools, and uh, yeah, he, he's amazing. He, he's been doing stuff with VR recently. He's got a company called Microdose VR. Uh, which is doing really well. He um, has like dome installation, 360 degree uh, projection mapping installations at festivals, um, in including like conferences <laughs> and stuff too. 
And uh, yeah, it's interesting because digital art is often disregarded and thought of as a lesser thing compared with traditional art like paintings on canvas. But I think he's sort of changing that um, per- per- perception a little bit. He's just high, really highly regarded and the detail in his like Photoshop work is amazing. Like I'd highly recommend checking out Android Jones if you haven't. Um, but yeah, personally, it's over the last couple of years, especially and especially since I, I um, first tried DMT, which is probably only a couple of years ago or less, um, I'd say the visions that I've had from psychedelics um, have definitely influenced uh, my work and all the artwork that I really want to create. And it's 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 focused me more on trying to um, reinterpret or repre- represent uh, the visions that I've had in my, my artwork. Um, so obviously I do commercial motion design kind of work and sometimes stills and um, new media or projection mapping stuff. But that's always obviously for a commercial client right um, in the advertising space but when, when it comes down to my day-to-day experimenting with cinema 4d or other software um i just i just love to sort of um do abstract um visionary artwork that's that's often um representational of my visions and it's not always abstract sometimes it'll it'll be more like have um figures or, or people or animals or something in it but um that's something i'm moving more into i guess the, these days so there's a, a cool artist that I found while kind of doing research for this episode named Brian Lewis Saunders. And we'll link to this in the show notes, everyone listening. But he, uh, I guess, did 30 self-portraits while under the influence of 30 different drugs. It's really fascinating. Uh, and then Brian Pollitt's another artist who did something similar. We'll link to both of those. So I'm, I'm curious, Caspian, do you design under the influence or is it more that you have these experiences and then they influence your designs afterwards yeah i'd say it's more it's more afterwards for me personally um there there are people yeah as you mentioned i've seen those um those experiments they're awesome but uh yeah i'd say there's there's probably less people that actually do that well under the influence i think it's easier for like physical artwork for that kind of thing like if you were to to do a little bit of mushrooms and then go paint or finger paint or draw on a sketch pad. Like I've definitely done that and that's really enjoyable. It really puts you in a flow state really easily and just it just comes out of you without thinking. Like I just love sketching and stuff while under the, under that sort of influence. But um, in terms of digital work, like um, if, it's, if it's doing 3D and rendering and I've got to, you know, open up Octane and open up plugins and do all that technical stuff, I, I've – well, from my little experimentation, uh, I found it doesn't really work that well for me. Like I almost just like don't want to be on the computer. Right, right. Um, I, I guess maybe if it was like Photoshop painting with a brush or ZBrush sculpting, that might be a bit different because it's a bit more of a, that kind of flow artistic thing. You don't have to hit as many shortcuts and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I really like just um, doing a, a decent kind of dose of something. And then maybe it's while I'm away camping for the weekend with friends or something. And then the visions I get from that maybe during or after I'll sketch them down or write notes about them on a notepad. Um, and then like in the week or, or longer following, I'll kind of try and recreate that digitally if I can or recreate that in a different way. Um, but it's interesting because like Alex Gray, who you mentioned uh, in his book, he talks about how some of the like glimpses or snippets he gets from visions of will form a greater idea, but that greater idea like a painting might actually take years to finally get into a completed form. Um, so he's definitely got that approach too of like the the visions and the detail in these visions is often so intricate and detailed and powerful that it'd be pretty much impossible to recreate it in, in that sort of space of six to 12 hours or her, however long the, the trip is. <clears throat> um, so yeah, definitely like afterwards is a good way to go. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you talk about having the technical overhead of like firing up octane and UV unwrapping something while under the influence of a yeah. psychedelic. And it's, and it's interesting because, you know, my drug of choice is coffee, <laughs> right? And, and people forget, people <laughs> yeah. forget that caffeine is, uh, you know, I, I guess mm-hmm. technically you could consider it a, a nootropic. It's, uh, you know, it changes the way you feel. It enhances some cognitive abilities and that's good for hyper-focusing for me anyway. So if I, have to open Cinema 4D and build some elaborate rig, coffee, caffeine really, really helps me. But I think you're right. Like if I was, you know, stoned (laughs) and trying to do that, I don't know if it'd go very well. Now, one of the things you've mentioned a few times um, is that you try to capture the visions that you see while on these trips. 
And, you know, Alex Gray very famously does that. And I, I didn't really, I mean, I assumed his artwork takes a long time. It is crazy detailed, but it never occurred to me that it's that detailed because the visions are that detailed. I've, you know, I think the strongest psychedelic I've ever tried was uh, mushrooms in, in Amsterdam. So I've never tried LSD or DMT. Can you attempt? I'm sure this is impossible. But can you attempt for some, <laughs> you know, for people listening, I'm sure there's a lot of people who've never tried any psychedelics and don't plan to, but are probably very curious about what you see, you know, in your mind's eye when, when you're on these trips. Can you sort of describe what those visions are like and how they work? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. I guess I'd have to almost get into giving some specific examples. Um, I'll just quickly start by like one example from Alex Gray is um, – I went and saw him speak actually, him and his wife Alison earlier this year in Vancouver and they talked about uh, this this shared vision they had. So they would do LSD and lie down on a bed in a dark room together and um, go on a, a journey. And um, one vision, they both had a shared vision one night. Uh, this is going back decades I think now, but it was a super influential one for them where they, they sort of envisaged this, what they call the uni universal mind lattice and it's this like uh, crazy kind of toroidal shape um, made of lines like a mesh um, that are, are white lines radiating out from a central point and and spiraling around and like you can follow that light around in infinity basically. So it was, um, they both, when they kind of came out of it, they, or during, I'm not sure, but they sketched down on a notepad and they pretty much sketched down the exactly the same thing. Um, and then, yeah, so they, they were, they realized the power of that and then they sort of tried to make that kind of infinite form into something more finite. And that's often how Alex Gray describes that, that visionary art process is like the visions are so infinite that, but I have to put it into this constrained canvas or like something that's in a box, which is really difficult. Um, but yeah, myself personally, like, um, one recent, I think, um, DMT or Chunga has like been the most powerful for me, although I have had a really, really um, powerful visions from a mushroom trip as well once when I was camping and had sort of like visitations from mermaids and beings kind of swimming in front of my, my vision wow. and it would just ch change <laughs> in an inst instant and I, you know, get like, like spirals of rainbow light across my vision, like a transition effect almost, and then it would be a completely another world with other beings. Um, and so those kind of eyes, eyes closed visuals, um, are really amazing. And again, it's something you can't recreate at the time because you've got your eyes closed and if you open them, you're not going to have the, the vision, so to speak. But, um, the same with DMT. So DMT lasts about probably five minutes. It's not very long, but it's super intense and your perception of uh, time is changed. So it can actually feel like hours sometimes, or I don't know, it's hard to describe what that, that time, um, feels like. But I've definitely had, uh, yeah, like kind of cheeky, um, like, I don't know whether you would say alien or elf-like or pe lots of people have different descriptions and different um, experiences, but definitely had beings kind of visit me and like dance with me and um, kind of entice me and all kinds of things um, from different, various different trips. And, of, and usually I'll, I'll often get like a message from that trip too. So from like a single DMT experience, the overwhelming message from my first first one I remember was love. So I just got this overwhelming um, feeling and sensation throughout my body of love and warmth and uh, these kind of feminine beings like giving me love and telling me to love myself and really, really amazing. And then from other ones I've had like the message would be fun, like have more fun and it was just all silly, silly kind of message. And then another one was, was dance, Rem remember to dance and how important dance is in your life and stuff like that. So as well as the visions and the, the actual visuals and the crazy abstract fractals and eyes and crystal caverns and stuff that, that I have seen and other people will see and try and reinterpret. There's also often uh, a deeper message or meaning um, that I'll get from a trip too, which is amazing. Do you think there's other benefits artistically, especially, you know, as, as like a motion designer, even in the sense of doing client work, um, are there other advantages besides just kind of being exposed to these, these visuals that are indescribable and unlike anything you could possibly see in your normal day to day, but, you know, like uh, uh, aside from trying to capture that in a, an illustration or a painting or something like that. Are there other advantages? I mean, do you, do you see, and this may be a silly question. I'm just trying to just see like how practical the advantages really are. Do you, do you 
I do ideas come to you more easily. Do you feel more creative? Um, you know, is it easier to kind of see design and put co color combos together or is it really not about that? No, it's, it's definitely good for those things. Um, I don't know if you, you, you mentioned you wanted to touch on microdosing again. Would that be a good time to mention? That oh or? yeah. Yeah. Let's bring this up. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, like from a larger trip, like what I was just talking about, like a, an experience where the trip will last for hours or, or if it's an intense trip like DMT. Um, there'll be like an afterglow and I'll just feel amazing for a day or two afterwards and definitely feel more relaxed and be able to focus better, be in a better mood. So even if that's at the office doing client work or whatever. Um, but for microdosing, which is taking a really small dose of something um, in, a, in a frequent kind of period, um, there, there's, I'll go into myself. I recently experimented with microdosing uh, mushrooms for about a month um, or just, just over. And so what that was is about 0.1 of a gram, which is a really, really small dose, like almost imperceptible, but you do still feel it. And I would have it in the morning, uh, usually with a coffee so that they kind of enhance each other and you get that, the caffeine kind of hit and focus, but then you also get a bit of the mushroom feeling as well. So I did this once every three days for over a month. And uh, so you have two days in between where you don't dose. And I would also journal every day um, at the end of the day on like how it had affected my day. So I'm, at the moment I'm putting together like a blog post and I'm going to also submit uh, findings to this this guy, James Fadiman. He's got a, a website about microdosing and he, he's taken hundreds and hundreds of different um, uh, people's experiences and he's going to put it together into a research paper. Um, but yeah, the, the, the effects that I had from microdosing over that month, just to summarize, were just like really intense periods of focus and mental alertness for the hours following the kind of dose. Like when I have just coffee, I'd find I'd like, like, yes, it could focus me, but maybe only for like half an right. hour. And then it would kind of, and especially if you have a lot of coffee and you keep having coffee, um, it can make you really unfocused and scattered and like, oh shit, I should, I got to check my emails and I got to do this. And like, you think of all the other little tasks you got to do or you, what you forgot to do or your to-do list. Um, but I found with, with the micro dosing, it would be more just like, I would focus on one task and I wouldn't, I would never even open up my emails or think about any, anything else I had to do. And sometimes that task might not have even been work, but it might've been something that subconsciously had been, um, really bothering me. Like I forgot, like I was going to sell something on, um, Craigslist and it, I've been meaning to do this for months. And one morning I microdosed and I'm like, fuck, I just need to go do this. And when it took photos of it, posted on Craigslist, got it done in about five right. minutes. And it's like, oh, it's out of my brain now. I can, it's decluttering. Um, so it's sort of reorganizing the brain and also accessing memories, whether that's like short-term memories or, or memories from ages ago that can be really beneficial. Um, uplifted my mood throughout the day, gave me a really positive outlook, reduced anxiety, um, I was just able to prioritize tasks much better as well. Like what's really important. Um, and the other one, which the first time I microdosed actually was not a, on a work day at all. It was just like on, I was out on a beach chilling out <clears throat> and, um, I got all these kind of really interesting, creative outside of the box ideas about business and entrepreneurship. Um, and like realizing what my true passions are and, and how I should pursue them and things like that. So, and even just com like conversations with people too were, were improved. I found like I was just a lot more comfortable in conversation. Yeah. So you've brought up a, a lot of a lot of really interesting things that happen. And, and I guess in my, exp you know, I, I've been kind of curious lately with this group of drugs called nootropics. I'm sure you're familiar, but for anyone listening, uh, nootropics, it basically is anything that enhances um, mental performance. So caffeine is the most common nootropic, but there's these commercial ones now you can get. Um, there's a, a really famous one is uh, Joe Rogan is affiliated with this company on it. They make this stuff called Alpha Brain, which has a bunch of nootropics in it. And, and I've tried that and that actually mm -hmm. does work pretty well. Um, I've tried things like uh, Kava and Kratom, which are both sort of plant-based nootropic type of things. Um, and, you know, I found that I am way more focused on those things too, but my take on it is that we all kind of get into a groove and our, our, we have these thought patterns and these, you know, and you kind of establish them and then they just repeat over and over. And that, I think that's why it's so easy to fall into the trap of, oh, I haven't checked my email in five minutes. I should check it again. I should see if I got any mm -hmm. retweets on that tweet. And just you know, every three days having your brain sort of wired differently because of something you've put in your body 
it's just going to naturally give you a totally different experience and allow you to kind of reprioritize a little bit. Um, so I've been trying very hard throughout this interview to not sort of, you know, uh, become a proponent of everyone going out and trying drugs. But again, I just want everyone thinking about this stuff because as artists, as motion designers, as freelancers, entrepreneurs, like you mentioned, uh, there's a lot on your mind. There's a lot to juggle. And sometimes your mind is not, you know, you've got a lot of bad habits in there and these things can really help kind of shake those up in my experience. Would you agree with any of that? Yeah, totally. I think it, it just, it helps with being in the moment too, right? Because we're one thing that, that came to mind as you were speaking just then is, is stress, like especially as totally in our industry and how go, go, go it is. And whether you're a business owner or, or an individual or a freelancer, um, there's just so much, there can be so much stress throughout the day and you're just working day in, day out, often long hours and, yeah, you, you forget to relax and, and be in the moment. And um, that's what, like, especially mushrooms and other other psychedelics in small doses um, are amazing for, I find, is just whether that's being in nature or just around at home or, or wherever, uh, really taking in your surroundings and remembering how amazing it is to be alive is just really important. Totally. So let's say that, you know, someone's made it through uh, this interview so far and they're we've piqued their curiosity. And so they'd like to start learning a little bit more about this. Are there any resources that you found sort of, you know, your journey experimenting with these different tools, medicines um, that you could recommend that if people just want to kind of start to learn a little bit more about these things and how they work? Yeah, totally. Um, there's quite a few. I'll just mention a few quickly. Um, so there's David Nutt, who I mentioned before. He's a British psychiatrist and I think he's like a pharmacologist as well. So he specializes in like research of, of drugs that affect the brain. I think he was actually a government advisor for um, the UK government at one point as well. Um, but he, he had some controversial statements about uh, like MDMA being safer than alcohol and things like that, which weren't too popular. Right. Um, but I definitely recommend, recommend looking him up and reading some of his articles or checking out his podcasts. Um, there's also Anne and Sasha Shulgin, um, the sort of American chemists. Uh, there are a couple and biochemists, and they've written a couple of really good books. One called Pikal, it's like P I H K A L. Um, and then there's also there's an organization. This is probably a good one for people to check out. An organization called Maps, M A P S, which stands for the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. Um, and they they started in the U.S., but there's also a Canadian sort of um, version of them. Um, and the the I'm trying to think who it was that um, started Maps out. He's pretty famous as well. I think it's oh I think it might have been. It's not McKenna, is David, it? Nick, David Nichols. No, Terence McKenna is actually worth checking out too. But he, in terms of like um, research, he's he's more of I'd say like a philosopher and uh, an intellectual and a writer and. He's got a book called Food of the Gods, which I, I've just started reading, which is really, really good. Um, but he's, yeah, he's had a lot of kind of controversial stuff too. I, I do, I'd recommend listening to him because he's an amazing speaker. Um, but in terms of like research and like more research-based approaches, um, there's, there's another guy actually, uh, Robin Carhart Harris, I just found a while ago, who's um, the head of psychedelic research um, in brain sciences in London. Imperial College, and he's got a TED a TED talk um, video actually about psychedelic. I think it's called Psychedelics Lifting the Veil, and it's just a short like fifteen minute talk talking about <clears throat> how he's using it for um, psychology and and uh, anxiety and depression. Um, so definitely recommend that one. And then in terms of um, DMT, there's one I wanted to mention quickly is um, Rick's. So you mentioned the spirit molecule and how it can be called that. Um, there's a Netflix documentary called The Spirit Molecule, but it's it's based about um, these studies done uh, decades ago, I think in the 80s, by this guy called Dr. Rick Straussman, and he's a he's a, um, a psychiatrist as well, I think, um, and he did a lot of study with uh, intravenously injecting DMT into into volunteer patients, wow. and that was I think that was government sanctioned or legalized like before they really cracked down and banned. Uh, the substance <clears throat> across the board or the, or they just allowed for this study uh, but it, it's very interesting sort of hearing about people's like they they even in that um, Netflix documentary they uh, the patients kind of talk about their visions and experiences and how life-changing it was so 
That's a good one. Oh, too. that's fascinating. I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. And I'll recommend too for everybody if you if you want to learn. Those are those are all amazing sources. But you know, if you kind of like uh, podcasts, maybe a little less uh, sciencey take on it too. I would check out the the Joe Rogan podcast. Joe Rogan. Uh, talks about a lot of things, but he talks about psychedelics quite a bit. And uh, also Sam Harris, uh, who also has a podcast and, and has spoken about this stuff. And even Tim Ferriss um, really yeah. talks about this stuff more and more. The, the other one I was going to mention that goes with that is Aubrey Marcus, who he's done stuff with Joe Rogan, like they often be on the same He's podcasts. the CEO of On It. He's the guy that creates Alphorn. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But he's got a podcast called AMP, which is the Aubrey Marcus podcast. And that's got some really interesting ones about psychedelics too. And he's also done two uh, fi films, like one hour films, which are really awesome. And they actually have a bit of like motion graphics and stuff happening in them too. But they were about journeys that Aubrey did um, down in South America uh, one with, I think one's called Huachuma, which is like a type of uh, cactus. It's also called San Pedro. So it's about how he and a group of people went and did a, like a San Pedro um, ceremony with the shaman. And uh, then he's got a new film that just came out this year called Drink the Jungle, which is uh, about a similar thing, but about ayahuasca and ayahuasca um, retreat and experiences, which is really interesting as well. Cool. So let's say that now someone, you know, they go, they check all this stuff out and they're like, all right, I'm kind of curious. I think I want to try something. Are there any substances that you would recommend starting with? They're a little more beginner, you know, you don't start with the intravenous DMT, right? <laughs> yeah. What would you recommend? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a good question. I think like you said, um, Carver and Kratom, although I haven't tried them, I've heard they are more mild kind of relaxants, but they can also go, uh, well with coffee. Um, and then they, they can create a different kind of effect of focus and stuff. Um, I'd say cannabis as well. Um, especially given that it's legal in a lot of places now and becoming more and more accepted and easy to get. <clears throat> um, and there's obviously different strains of cannabis that, and, and there's um, the CBD, which is more of a muscle uh, body relaxant. It doesn't give you the kind of the high that other strains do that have more THC. So, yeah, definitely recommend that. And then if you, yeah, if, I mean, if you can find mushrooms, I'd say they're a good one to experiment with. But just do your research in terms of the dosage. So maybe start, I think with anything, just start smaller and to see how you like it and you know don't do a huge dose of mush mushrooms and yeah that could be pretty intense for your first time yeah that could be a mistake <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I can i can speak about kava and, and, and kratom I've, I've tried both of those and uh, they are far more mild than even you know marijuana um you know it, it's kava is like I don't know. It feels kind of like you drank a beer, except different, and you, and you don't get hung over. It's just, it's just a very it's mild. Kratom's a little bit stronger, um, and there's different strains of it, but again, very mild. And then, you know, if you try cannabis, I would just recommend don't eat it. Don't eat like a brownie or something the first time you try it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned um, it's smart to start with small doses if you're going to experiment with these things. Uh, it should be said a lot of these things, if you're eating, you know, pot brownies or if you're eating mushrooms, the effects can take hours to come on. And if you're a rookie <laughs> and you think, oh, I didn't take enough and then you take some more, you can have a real bad day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, Caspian, if someone's like, all right, you know what? I'm in. I'm all in. I want the full experience. I want to blast off and I want to open my third eye. And I want to see, I don't remember what you said, tessellating the infinite loop and, you know, all this stuff. What's the safest way to do that? And, and how would you explain to someone who is about to essentially go out and find things that may not be legal where they live? Um, you know, how do you do that in a, in a safe way that's not going to, you know, get you in big trouble? Yeah. So like with, with any, um, kind of medicine or drug, I think like the, it's really important and something you'll come across a lot. If you're doing research, people talk about set and setting and they're really important. And, um, that's basically talking about being in a good mindset. Um, so it, you know, it, it you don't have to be in the best mood, but you know, maybe don't be really sad and crying and, and or really angry or totally distraught or something like that. <laughs> um, and, and the setting like, um, yeah, the, what the day's like, where you are, uh, what the space you're in. Um, make sure you're in like a nice, comfortable, safe space, basically. Um, don't be somewhere, 
you're unfamiliar with or uh, I wouldn't, you know, go out into the forest at night on your own <laughs> and do a big dose of something. Um, so, yeah, like, um, yeah, start start with a moderate dose if you can, but then once you're ready, uh, make sure you, whether it's at home in a comfortable room with a friend or two um, or alone, if you're comfortable being alone, uh, maybe with some music and artwork around and stuff, you know, activities to do if you get um, antsy or something. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, but they're also great. Psychedelics are also great in nature and they enhance each other. So, yeah, definitely recommend if you're on like a camping trip or something with a, with a friend or two. Um, and ideally, if you can find like someone who's experienced in that substance already, someone who's can be a bit of a guide for you or um, sometimes people will even, if they're a bit more anxious, they might um, want to have a sitter, which is someone who doesn't do the um, substance with them, but just stays sober and sits there to help if anything comes up. Um, but usually it's kind of good to do it together because it really connects people. Cool. That's really good advice, man. Um, and my last question is, do you think that you're going to be experimenting and using psychedelics for the rest of your life? Do you think this is sort of one phase of your life and then it's over when you get older? Or do you think that this can be a part of your life, you know, for the long term? Yeah, no, I, def I definitely think it's a long-term thing. And I, I think we're, we're experiencing, a lot of people talk about now, there being a psychedelic renaissance. So obviously there was that period in the 1960s where everyone was, was um, really into them. And uh, then with the ban and becoming, uh, you know, a lot harder to get and illegal and everything, it's it's been a, a bit of a journey. But I think with the amount of people pushing for either legalization or at least for legalization of studies and things like that, and so people like MAPS, um, I think it's becoming a lot more like socially acceptable and more people are waking up to how powerful they are. Obviously, Silicon Valley and stuff like that too, microdosing is kind of taking off there. Um, even people like Steve Jobs talked about how important LSD was for them. Um, so, yeah, myself, I think it, it in the last few years, it's become more important for me and really changed the direction of my art and um, my probably my career as well. But, um, yeah, I think that's definitely going to continue. I don't see why that wouldn't continue uh, into old age even. There's a lot of people um, that are older in life that are still using psychedelics in some way as a tool. Love it. And, you know, I, I hope that, you know, if there is this renaissance happening, maybe, you know, the, the After Effects Alex Gray is out there somewhere and <laughs> one day there's going to be this mind-blowing, like, you know, visualization of the third eye opening or whatever happens. So, um, listen, man, I really appreciate how honest you've been about all this and kind of being an open book about your experiences and, and your thoughts. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're definitely going to have to... Um, have you back on uh, to revisit this in a little bit. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Joey. It's been awesome being on here. I really have to thank Caspian for being so honest and open about his experiences. There's a ton of social stigma around this topic, and I think that's sad because it makes it very difficult to get accurate information about the effects and risks of these substances. I don't know if this episode changed anybody's mind, but I hope it at least made you think. Thank you so much for listening. Head over to schoolemotion.com for the show notes on this episode, and we will definitely catch you on the next one.